up the majestic highlands where mountains meet the sky, an unmistakable rhythm of life governs all. It is distinctly familiar, yet born of an ancient civilization ruled by nature's spirits. It pulsates into each of the mountainous domains, pulling them together into one united landscape. The Cordillera Administrative Region is the premier highland region of the Philippines. Six provinces and a chartered city define its territory. There's Apra, the Bamboo Province. Apayao, nature's last frontier. Kalinga, home of ancient traditions. Mountain Province, caves and handicrafts. Ifugao, ancient cultural landscape. Binguet, salad bowl of the Philippines, and the city of Baguio, long acknowledged as the summer capital of the Philippines. More than just scenic, the views of the Cordillera region are breathtaking canvases, painted by natural elements and the passing of time. Steeped in history, each destination is ready to take you by the hand, to draw you in and share their stories over cups of Highland coffee. We travel first to the province of Abra, with its own district of 27 municipalities led by the capital town of Bangin. Abra is landlocked by its Cordillera neighbors, Apayao, Kalinga, and mountain province in the east. To its west are Ilocos Norte and Ilocos Sur. Abra River, one of the country's largest river systems, flows throughout the province. A great vantage point to marvel at this Abra River basin is the Calaba Bridge, a 900-meter modular bridge that spans the Abra Ilocos Norte National Road and connects three municipalities to the capital town, Bangued. Among the must-visit destinations in Abra are its landmark religious structures. In the town of Tayum, faithful penitents flock to the Santa Catalina de Alandria Parish Church. Distinctly Baroque in architecture, it was built by secular priests to Christianize the Tingyans of Abra in the 19th century. In 2001, this tangible landmark has been declared as the National Cultural Treasure by the National Museum of the Philippines. The people of Abra are known for their simple yet focused attention to detail and hard work. Outstanding among their character, however, is their ingenuity in weaving masterful creations using the bountiful resources provided by the land. With an abundant blessing of hectares upon hectares of public, private, and forest land, the provincial towns of Abra are among the biggest cultivators of bamboo species called buho and kawayan tinik. For this, Abra has proudly earned its title as the Bamboo Province of the Cordilleras. Within many craft villages, it is a daily sight to witness men and women babbling about today's issues while busy at work with their bamboo splitting and intricate weaving activities. Unsurprisingly, a best-selling enterprise is the production and sale of bamboo handicrafts. Yet, apart from these traditional products, Bamboo in Abra is likewise highly sought for its flattened lumber and engineered version that is now used for furniture and home construction.
Abra is likewise home to the indigenous art of indigo natural dyeing. Culled from the barks, leaves, fruits, and roots of dye-yielding plants like indigo, the natural dye extracted from Abra's plants is used to splash color on food, drinks, cosmetics, textiles, and furniture products. What is perhaps the strongest proof of resourceful and creative talent in Abra is the fact that a living national treasure proudly resides and pays respect to the town of San Quintin. Teofilo Garcia is a Gawad Manilikha ng Bayan who received the highest award in 2012 for being a master craftsman and artisan of the traditional katukong or helmet. Made from a local species of bottle gourd called tabungao, this hat or cask is likewise called as such the tabungao headgear. Over the decades, Teofilo honed his craft, perfecting the natural feel for the right materials and the instinct for the tabungao lining's design. His skill and talent in basket weaving came in handy for this undertaking. Awareness about the tabungao has increased in recent years, primarily because of his constant participation in trade fairs. Fortunately, with the award also comes the opportunity to transfer the knowledge to more people, especially among the younger generations in his native town of San Quintin. This craft is very precious to us. It is a way of perpetuating our own local culture, which the present generation and the future generation will have to learn. As the sun sets over the mountains of Abra, a new day rises for its clever and imaginative young people who now hold the future of the Bamboo Province. The rhythm that pulsates throughout the Cordilleran landscape adopts a more youthful, adventurous flavor. As our friend Richard Hartman goes on the road, to discover his origins in four of the region's provinces. His first stop is the formidable nature's frontier up north, the province of Apayao. I'm half Filipino, half British by birth, but I was born and raised abroad. I've spent nearly my whole life in England, and I can't wait to explore the rich Filipino culture, the rich Filipino heritage, and learn what it means to be truly Filipino. Apayao is one of the most northerly provinces in the Philippines and is part of the Cordillera Administrative Region of Luzon. Bordering the south of Apayao is the province of Kalinga. To the north and east lies the province of Cagayan, and to the west, the provinces of Abra and Alorcos Norte. Apayao is a mountainous province covered in woodlands with large rivers flowing across the land. Their waters form in gently rolling valleys and large open plains. One of the major arteries of the province is the Apayao River, known for its clean waters and picturesque scenery. The river courses from the west of the province and passes through its heartlands, heading up north onto the Pacific Ocean. The most convenient way to reach Apayao is via Tagigarao Airport, which is just one hour flight from Manila, the capital of the Philippines. The airport itself is situated in the neighboring province of Cagayan, and is from the airport just a few hours drive to Apayao. One thing which is particularly striking about Apayao is its cool climate, which is amongst one of the coolest places I've been to in the Philippines. The air is crisp and fresh, and has a refreshing quality about it. A place to go and feel revitalized and renewed. The province is comprised of seven municipalities, each one offering a unique experience. The province is certainly rich in ecology and nature, with many areas of outstanding natural beauty just waiting to be explored. We're taking a relaxing paddle along Bakut Lake. It's around 10 hectares of water, so it's a pretty sizable piece of water. 
and it's the perfect place if you're a keen angler to do a spot of fishing. The waters are teeming with tilapia, which is uh, a local favourite, and you can catch your fish here and eat it as well. So that's perfect. Also, there's a beautiful island there which you can go camping, and you can also have a lovely picnic for the day. So it's a really, really quiet, tranquil, calm place and the perfect getaway, especially if you've had coming from the hustle and bustle of the city life and have a nice bit of greenery and fresh air. The lake is truly picturesque and the sounds of nature reverberate throughout the air. It is a haven for wildlife, a place where time seems to stand still, a fisherman's paradise and a nature enthusiast's dream. Without a doubt, part of the charm of the experience is the locally made boats. Riding them is an adventure in itself. Though perfectly safe, they are not totally watertight and sometimes require passenger participation in order to keep your feet nice and dry. And certainly balance is the key, with every abrupt movement rocking the boat. But fear not, as you are in expert hands and the guides will help you navigate around the lake. The landscape is quite breathtaking, a forgotten, unblemished world which has a timeless quality. The lake is home to several bird species, including native ducks, which pass their day without a worry in the world, as they gracefully glide over the surface of the water. They are incredibly shy though. Water can certainly form beautiful feasters, but when set to work over time, water can also create unusual masterpieces, and none more so than in the village of Morag. Morag hides a geological treasure just waiting to be explored. The first leg of the journey begins. As you can see, it's been raining quite heavily the last few days, and we were originally intending to go to the rock formations by foot. However, the water's quite high, so we've managed to get our hands on a boat over there. So we're going to cruise down the river Morag, and it's going to be a lot quicker and a lot easier, that's for sure. So I'm looking forward to the boat adventure. The boats are certainly sensitive to any slight movement, which makes the journey all the more exhilarating. It's like walking a tightrope. But after getting used to the fine balancing act, the journey is more than easy, especially with the guys at hand to ensure everything goes to plan. Some parts of the journey involve wading across the water, so make sure you bring your flip-flops to change into. Indeed, for there are no companions more loyal and true than a man and his dogs. These dogs are experts at navigating the waterways and wait forever patiently for the master. They can even swim from shore to shore to keep pace with their master as he ferries his passengers across the land. We have to change boats to cross the final stretch of the river. The expert navigates the waterways using nothing but a pole. Eventually we reach the island, and the rain has turned the ground to mud. However, the journey still goes on despite the weather. We enter the realms of the jungle on our quest to find the rock formations. Through dense thickets and trees we climb, forever getting closer to the goal of our quest. Jagged rocks permeate the jungle path, with vines and vegetations arrive. Our guides lead us through the path of rock and jungle, which weaves and snakes up and down, left and right. It's almost like navigating one's way through another planet, these strange fingers of rock stretching up to the sky with gnarled, twisted hands, making an unusual challenge. Though some parts are harder than others, no mountaineering experience is necessary, and as long as you are in reasonable health, anyone can circumnavigate the network of unusual shapes. That was certainly an adventure and a half with some quite arduous climbing there and some slippery rocks, but it's certainly worth it. The view is absolutely spectacular. The rock formations certainly are striking. The black rock stands in stark contrast to the sky above. Unusual weather processes have shaped these strange pillars into creation. They are certainly very unique there is nothing quite like them in the whole of the Philippines. It's certainly great to take a deep breath in and look out over the village of Morag from atop the rock formation. Morag Valley used to be riddled with conflict, a site where tribal wars used to be held. 
Today, it is home to a shrine which pays homage to the fallen during the war. Now considered a peace village, near the shrine is an ideal vantage point to look out and over the majestic river, which weaves through the countryside, feeding the nearby rice fields. Bubalayan Bridge connects the upper and lower Apayao regions. The winding river snakes across the landscape and is the bloodline of the province, providing irrigation for farming and the historical trade and transport links. This immense body of water carves out the landscape as it flows along its path and is framed by tropical woodland which covers a sizable part of the province. Often the tips of the trees are lost to the cloaking and shrouding mist, a magical view indeed. There are many remote communities scattered throughout the region which is surrounded by charming countryside which is both quiet and tranquil. The snag live throughout the region particularly in the upper half of Apayao, the communities being most prevalent along the Apayao and Abulog river systems. It is said that the name Isnag means people who have gone into the interior. The Isnag are known for their bright and colorful garb, and their skirts and waistbands feature bands of vibrant color. The skirts themselves are formed by a simple wraparound cloth. They also adorn themselves with angular headscarves, and the waist cloth serves a practical use which is to carry items around. Under the cloth, they usually wear a simple blue long sleeve blouse. A lot of effort goes into making these costumes, for they are traditionally handmade. These traditional looms are pedal powered, as well as patient powered too. To produce around 45 meters of fabric takes around 15 days, so a great deal of patience is required. It's laborious work, which requires much patience and devotion. The national treasures of the province are both breathtaking and inspiring. But there is one event which is of equal attraction and occurs only once a year. That event is the Siam Festival. On February the 14th in the year 1995, the province of Kalinga Apayao was separated into two provinces, Kalinga and Apayao. Every year during the week of February the 14th, the province celebrates the founding of the province with the Siam Festival, which is held in the municipality of Luna. Apayao is a land rich in natural wonders, timeless feasters, and majestic beauty, a place to be one with nature and appreciate its splendor. The rivers which run through the land shape and give it character and the natural geology has resulted in magnificent rock formations and spectacular scenery. Explore the lands and the sights and experience an adventure like none other. Definitely, Richard's ecotourism adventure in Apayao is just an initial foray into a deeper, more evocative understanding of the highland culture that is Cordilleran. Traveling southwards, he reaches the idyllic province of Kalinga, where a dynamic fusion of tattooing as an ancient art form and the adrenaline pumping activity of white water rafting make for a most memorable travel blog. Let's all join Richard as he conquers Kalinga, the home of ancient traditions. Kalinga is a province rich in culture and heritage, famous for its tribal ancestry. Formerly, the province was part of the province of Kalinga Apayao. However, in 1995, the province was divided into two separate provinces, Kalinga and Apayao. Kalinga contains nearly every type of terrain, from steep mountainous peaks and valleys through to plateaus, rolling hills and open expanses of lowlands. The rugged mountain landscapes contain peaks rising to almost 2,500 meters, their sides covered in lush forests. Agriculture is certainly an integral part of Kalinga. Rizal and Tabuk with their flat lands are the biggest rice producers. Next in rice production are the mountainous areas of Balbalan, Lubwagan, Pasil, Pinukpuk, Tinglayan and Tanulan, which are famed for their terraces. The rice terraces are ancient, 
formed from stone or mud walls. They are a wonder to behold, truly an awe-inspiring sight. The work that must have gone into making them is staggering. They flow so naturally along the contours of the valley, almost as if nature made them on their own accord. They are naturally fed from the mountainside water, truly a marvel of engineering. These terraces have withstood the test of time and will endure for many more years. One of the thriving industries in Kalinga is the coffee industry, which is the second biggest industry after rice production. Out of the eight municipalities which comprise Kalinga, seven produce coffee. The Kalinga blend is a combination of three varieties of coffee, Robusta, Excelsior and Arabica. Robusta and Excelsior make up the main body of the coffee and give the coffee its taste, whereas Arabica gives the coffee its aroma. In general, the higher its content, the more expensive the blend. One particular unique feature about the people of Kalinga, also known as the Inkalinga, Inkalingas, is their tattoos. And tourists come from far and wide to acquire them. For the Kalinga, they are a sign of strength, endurance and beauty. Could you talk us through the significance of your tattoo? Uh, this is a one form of Kalinga body art. Okay. Uh, which is very unique to the Kalingas and to mm -hmm. some other parts of the Cordilleras. And for the men, it speaks of honor. Ah, so for men it's like... Honor. Honor and strength. Mm -hmm. For the women it's for beauty and beauty. strength. Okay, these are certainly beautiful tattoos. Yeah. Traditionally for men, the tattoos speak of honor. They had to earn the right to wear one by killing. Killing for honor or in defense of one's territory or people. While well, men would earn their tattoos through honourable deeds, the women would be free to wear them as signs of beauty, strength and status in the community. Also, the tattoo was part of the rites of passage of women into adulthood. Known as the last living Kalinga traditional tattoo artist, she is Wang On Ugai from Buskalan, Tenglayan. She's a grandmaster in her field with years upon years of experience she received the prestigious Dangal Nung Haraya Award for the Intangible Cultural Heritage from the National Commission for Culture and the Arts in recognition of her contribution to the preservation of the hand-tapped tattooing, locally called Pagpapatok, leading to a heightened awareness about the culture of the Kalinga community. Another solid proof that Kalinga is home to living cultural treasures is Alonso Saklag, a homegrown and dynamic musician and dancer with a passion to preserve traditional Kalinga music and movement. With fervour, he educates and infuses pride of tradition among young students with the gongs, musical instruments and indigenous dancers, earning for him the National Living Treasure Award or Gawad Samalilika Numbayan Award for the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. The River Chico is one of Cordillera's longest rivers, have an estimated length of over 176 kilometers. It meanders through the center of Kalinga and provides an invaluable source of irrigation to the Kalinga people, feeding their fields upon fields of rice paddies. The river shapes the land as it flows, cutting through the rock to create striking rock faces and steep-sided valleys. Its waterways also provide essential transport links for the local people, as well as serving as a place to have a nice cool refreshing bath. The Chico River is also renowned for white water rafting. And what better way is there to explore the surrounding scenery than to give it a go? White water rafting in Kalinga can be done throughout the year. However, the prime time to raft is from June through to early January, as this is when the river runs most powerful. Fortunately for me, February is a time when the water levels are relatively low. Nevertheless, the ride is still thrilling. Whitewater rafting is suitable for all ages, shapes and build, 
and no experience is needed. The river provides the perfect platform to view some of Kalinga's picturesque scenery and there are many glimpses of Kalinga culture to have on the way. See beautiful geological features, sheer rock faces and explore the Kalinga wilderness while riding the River Chico. I have to admit though, sometimes it can get extremely confusing when you hear left side paddle, right side paddle and so forth and you have no idea which side is left and which side is right as the rock keeps turning around following the will of the river. However, it doesn't really matter as you're always in the hands of the experts. Many of the villages of Kalinga are nestled amongst the highest heights of the mountains, requiring off-roading or long treks to get there. As the old adage goes, the harder the journey, the sweeter the rewards, and Kalinga is a place where that certainly holds true. The mountainsides are home to many beauties which are lying in wake, just waiting to be discovered. Our travel takes us to the municipality of Pasil, an area mainly comprised of rugged terrain. It is situated in the southwestern part of the province of Kalinga and is west of the city of Tabuk. Waterfalls erupt from the sides of the valley emerging from the vegetation to cascade down its sides. There are so many wonderful waterfalls to be seen, each of varying shapes, sizes and power. The underlying river has carved some truly impressive landscapes, parting the two sides of the land to form a natural barrier which zigzags across the landscape. The only way to get from one side of the river to the other is via the numerous bridges which span the valley's expanses. Along the way, there are many, many beautiful sights to witness, such as the picturesque rice terraces which hug the mountainside, the striking scenery which extends as far as the eye can see. Feel the fresh mountain air filling one's lungs, almost feeling one with nature. For us city dwellers, the journey is somewhat tough, however the locals seem to do it with ease. The mountains of Kalinga are rich in natural wonders, such as geothermal vents, hot springs, steep-sided valleys with breathtaking views. The isolated villages exude charm and beauty. All these things make the Kalinga mountainside a must-see place to visit. I've had a fantastic time exploring the rich cultural and historical heritage of Kalinga. I've also enjoyed the hiking through the picturesque mountainside, the lovely rivers, and of course the scary bridges. <laughs> it's truly, truly an amazing place to visit, especially if you're into hiking and you love to see some really true native heritage that the Philippines has to offer. It is hard to forget the rhythm and vibe of the northern highlands once you've experienced its first three jewels. Up close and personal with the bamboo province of Abra. Nature's last frontier that is Apayao. And Kalinga, the home of ancient traditions. It is impossible to forgo one's journey to the rest of the provinces that complete the Cordillera administrative region. For now, it's time to let the rhythm take over.